Welcome. You are listening to the Family Legacies Project. Our guest today is Patty Williams, speaking for the National Conversation on Race. My name is Don McNeil. Today is January 10th, 2020. We are recording in Raleigh, North Carolina. Good afternoon, Patty. Good afternoon, Don. Patty, the interview today is going to center on your memories of um, race and racism in your life. And we're going to start with your home. Could you tell us where you are from? I am from a small town in Alabama. It's called Leeds, L-E-E-D-S. Leeds is less than 20 miles from Birmingham, Alabama. Okay. And what year were you born? 1955. 1955. Let's start with your your earliest experiences. Um, do you have any memories involving racism before school, before you started first grade? I do. And it would be, there was a clinic, a health clinic in our town because we were, we didn't, well, there was a hospital there in town, but there was a local health clinic. And we would go to the health clinic to get our vaccinations and just keep up with whatever we needed as children. It seems that we always went during the summer and we sat in separate areas. There was an area for black people or colored as they usually designated those. And there was an area for white people. And as I recall, I think it was all just one big room and it kind of was divided with a little divider or something. Okay. And so that let me know that somehow we were separate and we were different. There were kids on the other side too but it was just a difference. We were, we were kept separately, but the same nurses saw us. Okay. So even though nothing was said, it was understood that you were separated by race? Yes. Okay. And how do you think that affected you as a, as a young child? Well, I think as a young child, you don't really understand why, but you do wonder why are we, why are we separate? You know, for me, it's we're all people. Those are kids. You know, I should be able to play with them, you know, but we had to stay on our side and they stayed on their side. If you had gone on the other side, do you think your mom would have just gone to get you and brought you back? Probably because I saw some of that when some of the white kids would venture over or their ball would come over to the other side and their parents would be like, you get back over here. So it was that kind of thing where there was a lot of policing going on, keeping everyone separated. Okay. You know, we always hear about uh, water fountains. Yes. Did, did you have that experience? I don't recall really seeing a water fountain with that, but... There was a local optometrist in our town, and pretty early in in life, I, I wear contacts now, so I needed glasses. And I do remember, it seems like it was around the sixth grade, and you know, this was probably 1960. This was probably the early 60s, and we went to the eye doctor. There was a separate entrance, and it had the word colored up over it. We went in the same office, but we went in a side door. So I still remember that. Okay. That idea that you were always separated. Yes. By race. Okay. Um, let's start your school experience. Mm -hmm. How did the segregated era affect your schooling? It would be kind of hard for me to say that, but I do know that once I started going to predominantly white schools under a plan that Alabama had called the Freedom of Choice, when I, I was a very good student in my segregated school, 
But when I got to that school, I noticed that I felt like some of the students read more fluently than I did, or they wrote more fluently than I did and used better language. So I started to study a little bit harder because I did see that I was behind somewhat or that they read bigger books. There were just things that I noticed and it wasn't because I couldn't do it. It was because I'd never been challenged to do it. Okay. So through hard work, you were able to catch up? Yes. Okay. It's probably safe to say that not everyone did though. I would say they probably didn't. Yeah. I'm just going to ask you to share stories uh, of any time racism intersected your life. Just share any stories that you feel like sharing. Well, I guess one that kind of comes up, and this wasn't really early in life, but as a person of color, you don't see it as much now because there's no one in the stores to help you anymore. But when there used to be clerks in the store that help you to get your things together or check you out, when you walk in the store as a person of color, lots of times you're followed or paid more attention to. And it doesn't matter how dressed up you are. You can go in there in a $500 suit and a $1,000 purse. It's just that if, if you look around, you can see that eyes have been watching you and they may look away. So that's one of the ones that really just kind of irks me. That's one I remember. And even, and like I said, now I don't see it anymore because there's no help in the stores anymore. Yeah, As you know, true. if you go shopping, you can hardly find anyone to check you out, you know, to take your money. But when there was, you know, lots of clerks in the store, that was a very prominent thing that I remember. I've heard african American especially women, share the experience that why people sometimes assume that they work in the store mm -hmm. and that they'll ask them for help even though they're just a customer. Okay. So have, have you ever heard that? Not not really, I haven't. Okay. But I could, I could see that happening. Okay. Um, let's talk about what was going on in, in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. Um, during your childhood, what what memories of um, of the segregated South do you have, especially since you grew up in Birmingham? Yes. Well, one thing that I always remember is one of my sisters was to graduate from high school in 1963, and they were going to have a prom. The prom was going to be in April of that year. So there was so much going on in Birmingham with all the back and forth and all the racial stuff that they had to cancel their prom. It was going to be at a club, a nightclub in Birmingham. So they had told black people, try not to gather in large groups. So she was not able to have her prom that year because of all of the racial tension that was going on. That was traumatic, wasn't it? Well, I'm sure it was. I remember it, and I was a small child. I'm 10 years younger. Mm -hmm. So she was probably 17, and I was 7, but I still remember that she didn't have her prom. Yeah. Were there any incidents? At, uh, did you go to your prom? I did. You did. And what year was that? That would have been 1972 and 73. You shared with me a story about a picture that was taken that day. Yes. Now, that was not a prom picture. That We would have something called a leader pageant. It's where all of the girls would get dressed up and we would parade across the stage in our nice dresses. And then certain of those would be picked for different roles, like four or five people would be the top individuals. And, you know, they there would be a picture taken later. There may be 20 people in the contest but four or five people would be chosen for whatever that role was, and I don't remember that right now. But in the 11th grade, I was one of those people. It was myself and three Caucasian girls. We had a professional photographer that took all of the pictures, and he lined us up, and we took the picture, 
And of course, it was a picture we had to pay for. <laughs> so I, I told him that I wanted a five by seven. Well, back then, I don't know what he could see, but today you take a picture, it doesn't turn out right. You look at it, you take another one. So when the pictures came back, I noticed that half my face was covered by the girl standing in front of me. And, you know, there was nothing I could really do about it. And initially I was like, well, I really shouldn't buy that picture, but I did. And I still have it today. Just to think that a professional photographer, he knows what he saw through that lens, but that either he thought that I was invisible or he just probably, maybe he didn't want me in the picture at all. And so half my face is covered, but I have that photo today. And that photo probably means a lot to you as far as what it represents. It does. It does. Okay. You shared with me something about the University of Alabama. Could you tell us about that? Yes. When I came along, there were, and it still is today, two major schools in Alabama, the University of Alabama and Auburn. And I I had mentioned earlier that I was in a class. Well, my school was set up to where we had a maybe had 30 or 40 kids in a class. But when we took our main courses each day, we were divided up based on based off on academic ability. So I ended up being in the A section. It was A, B, C, and D sections because I was pretty good academically. And there was usually no other Blacks in my class. So during the time when Alabama and Auburn were getting ready to play, there was all this activity. Everybody was like, oh yeah, I'm going to the game or, or whatever. And there were some kids that would start to sing this fight song for Alabama. And the, the words were, it was, Alabama has a certain, you know, tone. Every school has a fight song. And the words were, yay, Alabama, crimson tide. Look at all those niggers on the Auburn side. And so they would just sing that song right out loud, you know, and I would just... I would just not react, not pretend I didn't hear. I always heard it, but I just wouldn't react. And they would just sing that song. So that is still in my head today. So what it told me was that, which may not be true, that maybe the people at Alabama were more prejudiced than the ones at Auburn. I don't know if that's true. Never, I was never able to validate it. But to this day, I have no... University of Alabama paraphernalia. And I don't ever think I would spend my money on that because of that, because that was common knowledge to the group of people that I was with. So those those hurtful feelings have stayed with you till today? Yes. Can you give me any, any other stories of of how racism has shaped who you are and what you believe? Well, I think what it forced me to do is that every day you have to build your self-esteem internally because if everything around you is telling you something different, then you have to sit there every day and make sure that you know who you are. So that's that's what it did for me. And to for me, that's really a good thing because there's very little that can dash your hopes when you know that you have something inside. So th I think it was helpful in that regard. Okay. Patty, could you tell me about uh, your ongoing efforts to educate other people about race and race issues? Could you tell us about the national conversation on race? Yes. I met Don McNeil earlier this year, and we started to talk about some racial issues. And I saw that we have some common interests about making sure that whatever we can do to make things better will happen. So I want to be part of that conversation because I have a strong history in negative racial issues. But I think I've done okay with being able to pull through that 
And I'd like to transfer some of that to other individuals who may not be able to do that as well. So if it means that I can sit and tell my story and let them know, yes, this is a fact, this is how it is, but it still doesn't mean that you can't be the best you that you can be. Now, I've always, all of my friends and people that I talk to privately, they know that I know a lot about racism. You know, I advise them on different issues because I've been into so many different arenas. I've been in corporate America. I've been in healthcare. So I've seen racial things along all of those lines, all of the unspoken things, the innuendos, and I'm very observant. I pick up on all of that. So I've tried to transfer that knowledge as much as I could along the way, and I've been doing it in a private kind of way. So if with me doing this national conversation on race, I can do it in a more public way, and maybe it can reach and help more people. Why do we need a national conversation on race? Because there is none. If there is one, it is superficial. It is not real. It's just, oh yeah, such and such and such. It's everybody wants to stay on the surface. But I think when you dig a little deeper and you tell what the real foundation is and how it can really be hurtful or helpful or whatever it's going to be, I think it makes a difference. So I think we need to get below the surface and not be afraid to do that. And I think you shared with me that um, one of the goals is to not shame people for what they believe. As long as they're willing to share it in a respectful way and think about changing. Exactly. I think that's very important. Because my opinion or how I feel about things can't be the same as someone that I just met. They don't have my history. They haven't been where I've been. They have not done what I've done or experienced what I've experienced. So that I can't expect them to feel the same way about any issue around race the same way that I feel. But I would like to know their opinion. I would like to know it uncut so that I get to understand them better. I'd like for them to listen to me in the same way. So I would not like for anyone to be shamed or blamed for what their feelings are. I think the real key is for us to find out why do you feel that way? And are you open to change? And, you know, or do you want it to be better? You know, or are you happy with feeling that negative toward another race? Mm-hmm. You know, so can we change that? But if we can't bring it out, then we don't know what we have to work on. Well, you were born and raised in in Birmingham, Alabama, mm-hmm. so you were brought up in Ground Zero, yes, for the for our civil rights movement. That's right. So you have um, you have opinions and history and stories that are very valuable for the rest of us to hear. Patty, is there anything else you'd like to share about uh, how racism has affected you? Well, I would just like to summarize that even though it can be very brutal and hurtful, is that we learn how to turn that into something better. And however we need to do that, is it sharing? Is it being a better person or entering a conversation on race? Just whatever we can do to turn that into a positive, because I've always believed that If something is really, really, really bad or negative, then it has the potential to be really, really, really good and positive. It just takes more work to get it there. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Not right now. Okay. This has been the Family Legacies Project, and Patty Williams and Don McNeil, um are the co-founders of the National Conversation on Race. January 10th, 2020. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.